Is it true that the Jewish people stole the land of Israel from the Palestinians? Is it true that the Jewish people have no historical claim over either the land of Israel or the city of Jerusalem? The answer to these questions is very simple. The answer is no. The real truth is that these allegations against Israel are myths that are totally false. Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I would like to share our thoughts with you about the major myths concerning the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. Myths that have been propagated by both the Palestinians and the mainline press, both our national press and the international press. Nathan recently got so fed up with these myths that he decided to dedicate one of his imaginative and creative inbox videos to the subject of myths about Israel. And I would like to initiate our consideration of these myths by taking a look at his video. Now, Nathan, I want you to introduce this video, and, and I think you need to do so by explaining the format. There may be some people out there who don't understand the format. I mean, they're going to wonder why I'm wearing a beret, right? <laughs> okay. Well, we create a lot of short videos called inboxes to answer questions that people have, and uh, we like to be educational, entertaining, and enlightening. And the ed entertaining part was to do a parody of something. So we did a parody of a TV show called Mythbusters that involves guys who who break myths, like can you use gummy bears to power rockets or cook a lasagna in a uh, dishwasher. So enjoy. We, this is a parody, but I think it connects people to the main point that we're trying to say. Is should Christians really support Israel? God is fulfilling promises today that were made to the Jewish people thousands of years ago. These promises rest on a series of legal agreements called covenants made between God and the Jewish people that center on the land of Israel. The Cornerstone Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, grants the title deed of the land of Israel to the descendants of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This unconditional, irrevocable, and everlasting promise was literally sealed in blood. God's land covenant promised that Israel would one day become the prime nation of the world, that is, as long as the Jewish people remained obedient to God. The Davidic covenant promises an eternal king who will descend from the line of King David. One day this Messiah will rule over the entire world from Jerusalem. For hundreds of years, Christians have believed that because God said so, we should naturally support the nation of Israel. Seems pretty self-explanatory, wouldn't you say? Well, not so, says a particular group of Christians. Christians who meet at conferences with names like Christ at the Checkpoint. They question, should Christians really support Israel? No! Let's debunk seven of their most popular myths for why Christians should not support the nation of Israel. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. The Jews killed Jesus. Those who accuse the Jews of killing Jesus seem to have purposely forgotten that the Bible says, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus. So not only did both Jews and Gentiles participate in murdering Jesus, but in truth, we are all sinners and therefore all of us are responsible for Jesus dying on the cross. But reality check, Jesus himself clearly stated that he alone laid down his life 
and that no one took it from him. The Jews have been disinherited because of their unbelief. The Jews may have been evicted from the land twice due to their rebellion against God, but as Psalm 105 explains, God guaranteed in his Abrahamic covenant that the land of Israel unconditionally and forever belongs to the children of Jacob. And as the Apostle Paul argued in Romans chapters 9 through 11, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself. Did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. And so no, God has neither disinherited the Jewish people nor revoked his land covenants. The church has replaced Israel and now receives her inheritance. Not according to the Apostle Paul, he tells the story of an olive tree whose branches were pruned off due to unbelief and wild vines grafted on. But when the natural branches began believing again, they would be grafted back on the tree. Salvation may have come to the wild olive vines, the church, but God still has salvation planned for the natural branches, a believing Israel, who will call Jesus Savior. The Jews regathering back to the land of Israel can't be from God because they haven't repented and accepted Jesus as their Messiah. The Jews returning to Israel in unbelief is exactly what God foretold would happen. Isaiah prophesied the Jews would be regathered a second time from the nations of the world. And Ezekiel made it clear that the Jews would regather in unbelief in order for God himself to give them a new heart towards him. It's no accident of history that a people dispossessed from their country for 1900 years could have ever kept their ethnic identity and rebirth their nation two millennia later. Such a thing has never happened. And this is the nation of the Bible we're talking about. Therefore, the regathering of the Jews can only be a miracle from God. To support Israel is to support every action of the Israeli government. Nobody supports every action of any government, even their own. Supporting Israel is to support the redemptive work God is doing in bringing a remnant of their people to salvation in Christ and ultimately into the fulfillment of His covenants. The Jews stole the Palestinians' land and lived there illegally. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free! First off, the Abrahamic covenant grants the Jews the eternal deed to the land of Israel. Second, when the Jews began returning in the early 20th century, there was no such thing as a Palestinian. A handful of Arabs living in that wasteland sold the land back to the Jews at exorbitant prices. And third, Israel was created legally in response to a United Nations declaration passed in November 1947, which authorized the establishment of a Jewish state in the land the Romans had renamed Palestine. You can't steal land that's already legally yours. To support Israel is to hate the Palestinian people. Contrary to Arab propaganda, those who call themselves Palestinians enjoy more freedoms and rights in Israel than if they lived in any Muslim nation. For it's not the Jews who hate and abuse the Palestinians, but their own terrorist leaders who steal billions of their foreign aid and deny refugees access back to their own home countries of Syria and Jordan. Why, the Palestinians have been afforded several opportunities since 1948 to create another Palestinian state beside Jordan, but each time they have rejected those offers and instead responded with violence. Why? Because their ultimate goal is the annihilation of Israel. So who exactly is hating who here? With those myths busted, our guys will look at some of the reasons why Christians should support Israel. Outstanding video, Nathan. I, I just love Thank that you, one. Dr. Folks, uh, that particular video, together with the other 
uh, videos that Nathan and his assistant have produced are posted on our website. Nathan, tell our viewers how they can find those on our website. Sure, just go to our website at lamblion.com or christandprophecy.org. It's under media. We've got 15 of them so far. We continue to add more all the time. Also, check out our YouTube channel, Christ in Prophecy. Like and share. We want lots of people to see these and get the biblical answer to your questions. Amen. Well, folks, I want us to focus on the sixth point that Nathan made in his video, video namely, that the Jews stole the land of Israel from the Palestinians. Now, this is a very emotional argument that is used to picture the Palestinians as an oppressed and denationalized people. And that picture is the one that is being used on college and university campuses all across this nation to rally young people against Israel. So, what about it, Nathan? Did they steal that land? You can't, as the video said, steal land that isn't legally yours. <laughs> the Jews own the land legally first and foremost because God created the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis chapters 13 and then through 17 and Psalm 105 and other talk about a covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Jacob's descendants own the land of Canaan. So you're saying, first off, that they have title to the land given to them by God. By God. God Himself said, this piece of land is yours. Now, God also made a promise to Ishmael that His descendants, the Arabs, would have many people. And they have so much, much land. more land. Yeah, it's like 45 to 1, right? <laughs> for every 45 Arabs it's, it's one Jew. So, okay, they have now many let, me, more let me just play the devil's advocate here okay. for, with you for a moment. Because when you say God gave them the land, there's no doubt about that. That's, uh, that is in the Abrahamic covenant. And it's repeated over and over, over and, over and over and over in the book of, of Genesis. Covenant. It is repeated renewed to Isaac, it's renewed to Jacob. But the Jews were disobedient to God. Yes. They were ejected from the land and therefore they lost their title to it. Well, like the video said, there is a Abrahamic covenant, but there is also a land covenant or a Canaan covenant. And that is a provincial one depending on the Jewish people obeying God. Moses, before he died, Deuteronomy 28 through 30, talked about all the blessings the Jews would have if they followed God with all their hearts, but if they rebelled against God, then all these curses would come. Nations would come in and oppress them. They'd have economic problems, social problems, political problems. But if they continued to rebel, they would be exiled from that the land. That was going to be the ultimate punishment. The ultimate punishment. And we saw it happen twice. It happened. But they still had the, t the, the uh, title deed to the land. Exactly. Again, the Abrahamic covenant, as you teach all the time, wonderfully, is that the Abrahamic covenant is the eternal covenant, but the Jewish people have a, a promise they have to be faithful to live in that land, but they don't lose ownership of that and land. You know, uh, that is uh, emphasized in a passage that I'd like to uh, uh, point out to our readers and that, uh, to our viewers, and that is in Psalm 105. Uh, it's a passage that was written by uh, King David. And in verse 8, this is Psalm 105, verse 8, he says, He has remembered, speaking of God, He has remembered His covenant forever, the word which He commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which He made with Abraham, His oath to Isaac, He confirmed it to Jacob, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, I will give you the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. Now, I don't know how anything could be any clearer than that. Right, right. It's their land, it's their land forever. And what I'm sure the Palestinians or Arabs know is that the promise isn't just the little sliver of land they have, but from the oh. Nile to the Euphrates. Yeah. And I think that terrifies a lot of them because they know that one day they will, the Jewish people will have that land. Okay, well, another point that can be made about the land is that not only do they have an eternal covenant to the land given to them by God, but when they came back to the land in the late 1800s, uh, 1890s, and the early 1900s, they bought the land that they already owned, and they paid exorbitant prices for it. Right. Nobody wanted that land. It had become a desolation. In fact, the Bible says that when they are ejected from the land, it will become a desolation. And it became an utter desolation, a land of uh, the trees were cut down. It was a swamp, a land of, of malaria. Nobody wanted this land. In fact, I believe with all my heart that God made it a desolation on purpose so nobody would want it, and it would be their way waiting for the Jews when he it was time for them to come back. Oh, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, it's interesting what you say is they bought the land. They didn't buy the land from Palestinians no. because there was no such thing as a Palestinian. The Ottoman Empire, right, 
owned that land. It was part of the Ottoman Empire up to 1917. Yeah. After that, when the British took it over and it became a mandate, there was still no Palestinian people. There was a few Arabs and Syrians living in the land, right? Wouldn't it that the people identified as yeah. Syrians? Well, first of all, there were very few people living in the yeah, land. Yeah, it was a wasteland. And it was, and yeah. it was um, the, the land was owned by absentee landlords, mainly of whom lived in Damascus, very wealthy people. And the people who lived there, if you'd ask them what they were, they would all would have said, we're Syrians. That's, that was their identity, was Syrians. Uh, there was no you know, Palestine was just a geographical designation for a certain portion of the Ottoman Empire, like Texas is a designation for a certain portion of the United States of America. But it was never a sovereign state. And yeah. Jerusalem was never the capital of any uh, Muslim or Arab nation. In fact, never the capital of any nation except Israel. Right. And the Romans renamed the land right after the Jews rebelled in 135. Just to punish the Jews, they renamed it from Israel to Palestine, which is the Latin for Philistine, which was Israel's ancient enemy. So the Romans were really sticking it to the Jews by renaming it Palestine. Okay. Right? So, first and foremost, the land was given to them forever by God, the yes. title deed. Title Second, deed. when they came back, they bought the land. They did not take the land by force. They bought the land and incidentally they paid exorbitant prices and the Arabs laughed all the way to the bank. Yeah, why would you want to buy a swamp yeah, or right. a desert? What right? the Arabs didn't know is yeah. that God had also promised in the book of Ezekiel that when the Jews come back it would once again become a land of milk and honey like the Garden of Eden. And Isn't that's exactly it? what that is happened. Exactly what's now there's happened. a third point that we need to make and that is that the United Nations in November of 1947 voted to establish the nation of Israel. So, under international law, it is a legal nation. Yeah, and matter of fact, the Arabs to this day, they call it Napka Day. It's a day of mourning and regret because they rejected the idea that the UN gave Israel the land, but they also give the people who invaded after 1948 and were left there, the, what we call Palestinians today, the Syrians and Jordanians who were left there, they weren't allowed to go back in the Jordan. They weren't allowed to go back in the Syria. They were stuck in refugee camps. They could have made a nation that day too yes. as well, right? Yes, in November of 1947, the United Nations voted to take that little sliver of land that was left to the Jews and divide it in half between the Jews and the Arabs. And so, they could, on the very day that the Jews declared their state, the Arabs could have declared their state with the boundaries that had been established by the United Nations. Instead, they decided they wanted it all. And so, five Arab nations attacked with the intention of destroying the nation of Israel. Now, there is an official Palestinian state today, right? And that's the state of Jordan. Yes. They yes. have a, a country already, and it's what, three times bigger than Israel? Oh, yeah. And two thirds of the people are Palestinians. Palestinians. Okay, folks, let's turn our attention now to some of the myths concerning the city of Jerusalem. The Muslims claim Jerusalem as the third most holy site in Islam after Mecca and Medina. They claim there was never a Jewish temple in Jerusalem and that the Jews have no historical claim to the city. What about it, Nathan? Well, <laughs> I don't even know where they would say that they have a claim to Jerusalem. When you and I read the Bible, right, there are 800 references to Jerusalem in the Bible. And, you those, and, I, and those incidentally are specific references that say Jerusalem. They say Jerusalem. There are many more allusions and references yes. in poetic language like calling Jerusalem Ariel and so forth. Jerusalem is the hub of all of Israel, <laughs> all of the Bible. But you read the Quran, and you and I have both read the Quran, not one single reference to Jerusalem whatsoever. Well, but they claim there is. They, it, the Quran says that uh, Muhammad uh, rode his horse to a far off mosque, at which point he went into heaven and came back and so forth. And they claim that that was a mosque in Jerusalem. That no, he his ties were always to Medina, and when far off from Muhammad was always. Matter of fact, the whole calendar, Islamic calendar, centers around him taking the Hajj from uh, Mecca to Medina. Medina right. is the place that he would have gone. Plus, plus, there's one thing they overlook right. concerning that, and that is that in, Moh in Muhammad's life, there was never a mosque in Jerusalem. No, you're right. There Excellent was never point. a mosque Excellent in Jerusalem. Point. It was built long after that. Yes. <laughs> and that so, even the idea that, that he yet. would, all of this was really conjured up 
as the third most sacred site in all of Islam after the 1967 Six Day War when they suddenly decided we are going to make Jerusalem really a holy place for Islam so those Jews don't take that Temple Mount and do something with it. Right, right. And that is the whole purpose of the Temple, <laughs> temple Mount and the al Aska Mosque is a flag over the entire world saying we have the holiest city in the world, we are superior to Christianity, we are superior yes. to Judaism. And that is why that is the most what well, unfathomably expensive part piece of land in the entire yeah, world. And, and you are absolutely right about that. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. You talk to a Muslim today and they will say, what is on the Temple Mount? The Dome of the Rock, which is not a mosque itself. The mosque is at the southern end of the Temple Mount. But the Dome of the Rock is a shrine. They said the Dome of the Rock. And the Dome of the Rock is higher than the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And it is uh -huh. built on the site of the ancient temple, they used to say. And so they say, we are the supreme religion because our building is higher than yours and we are built on the site of the ancient temple. Now today they don't say that anymore because they, they, they deny that there was ever even a temple on the Temple Mount. That is their new deal. They are into denial. And the thing that is interesting about that is that back in the 1920s the, the uh, Muslims who were in charge of the Temple Mount published a publication about the Temple Mount mm -hmm. in which they said this was the location of the ancient oh, yeah. Jewish temples. They used to admit it. This denial has only come since Yasser Arafat suddenly decided he was going to deny, deny the whole Jewish history. So, he denied that they ever had any te um, temples on the Mount, and he denied that the Western Wall had any significance. And today you find the Palestinians even doing things like declaring that Jesus was a Palestinian. Yes. Well, I think the Muslims do two major things that prove they know that Israel is connected to the Temple Mount. One is that they closed up the Eastern Gate knowing that the prophesied Messiah would return. He wouldn't return to that a was done in the 1500s. That was yes. So they knew that that was tied to the Bible. And two, they don't allow any archaeological excavations on the Temple Mount. They're terrified that you have to dig just a little deep and then Jewish relics will show up all over but the place. But there's something funny about that. You're right. They will not allow any archaeological excavations because they know they will prove that the Jewish temples were there. But a few years ago they decided to build a mosque underground under, and, and without anybody's permission. They were supposed to get the permission of the Israeli government, but they didn't. Okay. So they go down and they start excavating tons of dirt. And incidentally that caused a bulge in the wall, the outer wall, which they blamed on Israel. <laughs> Everything is Israel's fault. Yeah, of they took all this dirt and dumped it in the Kidron Valley. And then one day a Jewish archaeologist got the idea, let's go over and sift the dirt. And they've been doing it ever since then. Tons and tons of dirt that was pulled out of the Temple Mount, and they're sifting it every day. And they're finding all kinds of artifacts from the second temple and the first temple that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that both temples sat on that Temple Mount. Right, right. <laughs> <It> just, <laughs> It, it, you really got to go. The purpose is, is satanic. Satan knows that Jesus Christ will return one day. He will enter through the Eastern Gate. He will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and he will rule the world from Jerusalem. And the entire world is just as Zechariah 12 and 14 says, against the Jewish people controlling Jerusalem. And I think one of the greatest signs was that was when President Trump came out and said, let's move the embassy from Tel Aviv into Jerusalem. And all but a smattering of tiny little countries were dead set against it. The UN for the first time condemned America about it. The whole world is against the Jewish people controlling Jerusalem. And to me, that is Bible prophecy coming alive. Well, you, be, you better believe it. Uh, we are seeing Bible prophecy fulfilled before our very eyes. Today, Nathan, and that's why I just get up in the morning. I'm so excited. This is the most exciting time to live, except yes. for the time when the first coming occurred. But uh, Zechariah 12 says that in the end times, all the nations of the world will come together against Jerusalem and against Judah. That's Zechariah 12, verse 2. It says it point blank, and that's exactly what we're seeing today: the whole world coming together against nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And they do it for one, I think, particular reason: is that the world would know if they read the Bible, the Davidic Covenant, the promise that given to David in 2 Samuel that one day a Messiah, a descendant from his line will come and he will rule and reign over the world. And the Jewish people, that those who are saved, obviously believers, will become a prime nation in the world. They will be a priesthood to the world during the Millennial Kingdom. And 
all of satanic influence, all of satanic hate is directed to Jews to try to thwart God's plan for that happening. You know, the only thing that UNESCO does is sit around and think of what resolution can we come up with next to condemn Israel for this, or condemn Israel for that, or condemn Israel for that. And what people must understand is that all of these agencies of the UN are dominated by Arab countries. Yes. And so they're just sitting there. You know, we have all kinds of atrocities going on all over the world, and what they want to do is pass resolutions about Israel. When they pass their resolution saying that Israel has no tie to Jerusalem and no tie to the Western Wall, I love the way Benjamin Netanyahu responded by saying, that's like passing a resolution that says that China has no tie to the Great Wall of China and that Egypt has no tie to the pyramids. It's just it's theater of the absurd. Yes, and I've actually heard uh, Netanyahu use that, theater of the absurd. <laughs> it is, it's absurd, and it has to be spiritual. We don't see the whole world dealing with real problems or real suffering, like North Korea, for instance, and how terrible they treat the Christians and put them in basically work concentration camps. But for some reason, they, Israel can't build an apartment complex without the entire world going bananas. And that is spiritual. And that, that to me is one of the best proofs that the Bible is the Word of God. Well, I praise God for our recognition of Jerusalem yes. because it's just such an insult to the Jewish people to say to them, you don't have a right to select your capital. What if somebody came over here and said, we don't recognize Washington, D.C. as your capital. We're putting our embassy in Chicago. Yes. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it has been a blessing to you. The Lord willing, next week we are going to continue discussing the myths about Israel, and we're going to focus on the treatment of the Palestinian people. Specifically, we will consider whether or not they are truly a people oppressed and persecuted by the Israelis. I hope you'll be back with us next week for that important discussion. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Everything discussed in this program and much more is contained in great detail in Dr. Reagan's book, The Jewish People, Rejected or Beloved? In this 230-page book, Dr. Reagan deals with a variety of challenging questions. Have the Jews ceased to be God's chosen people? Are they guilty of the unforgivable sin of killing God? Has God replaced them with the church? Have they lost all hope as a nation? Are they devoid of any role in the end times? Dr. Reagan deals with these and many other questions regarding the Jewish people, and in the process, he does so in simple, understandable language. The book can be yours for a donation of $20 more, including the cost of shipping. To order, call the number you see on the screen Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time, or place your order through our website at lamblion.com. And with each order, we will include a complimentary copy of Dr. Reagan's video album titled The Evil of Replacement Theology. It is a one-hour presentation that is so powerful that it resulted in Dr. Reagan being ordained ordained as an honorary messianic rabbi. When you place your order for the book and the video, ask for special offer number 670. Again, to order the book, The Jewish People, Rejected or Beloved, and to receive a complimentary copy of the video about replacement theology, call the number you see on the screen Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time, or order online at lamblion.com. And ask for offer number 670. It could be yours for a donation of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. Greetings in the name of Jesus. The staff at Lamb and Lion Ministries is very blessed and encouraged by the faithful support of all our Prophecy Partners who generously donate to this ministry every month. Your donations allow us to proclaim the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ through our television show, Christ in Prophecy, and through our magazine, website, conferences, and the many ministries we support, both domestic and international. If you are not partnering with us and would like to, we invite you to do so for a donation of just $25 a month or a one-time donation of $300 a year. As a Prophecy Partner, you will receive six issues of our exciting magazine, The Lamplighter, and six other, including either publications or videos. One of those gifts will be our annual Holy Land Calendar. Please partner with us to share the good news of Jesus' return. Call the number on your screen or go onto our website and become a Prophecy Partner today. I'm Todd Hutchinson with Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 